What is up, Iwoo crew? Today, we're covering three bizarre disappearances. It's an act magicians have been studying for decades. The art of disappearing without a trace. How does a person go from being captured on CCTV one moment to completely gone the next? How does a person vanish into thin air? In a world where Big Brother is always watching, how is it possible for people to disappear without a trace? Though our first case takes place at the King's Cross station in London, this is no Harry Potter. Andrew Gostin was your typical 14-year-old boy. Kevin Gostin never thought that September 14, 2007 would be the last night that he would see his son. Especially since the night before had been an average night spent putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Andrew was born July 10, 1993. Those around him knew him to be the smart but silent type. In school, he was in the Young, Gifted, and Talented program, a program specifically designed to enhance the learning of the top 5% of students. The teachers at his high school believed he was on track for acceptance into Cambridge. Andrew lived in Balby, Doncaster, a small suburb with not a lot going on. For a teenager, it could seem like an awfully small town. However, Andrew preferred to keep to himself. He had friends at school, but he never saw them outside of the classroom. There's also nothing to suggest he was bullied. He just preferred to be alone. He was just a kid who loved the goth scene and listened to bands like Slipknot and Muse. So what would lead a quiet kid to disappear without a trace? On the morning of September 14th, 2007, Andrew woke up late and irritated. Though this may seem like typical behavior for the average teenager, this was not the case with Andrew. Despite the strange behavior, no red flags were raised. Much speculation surrounded what Andrew did that day and where he was going. But here is what we do know. After waking up late, Andrew left the house at 8.05 a.m. Instead of catching the bus, he headed down to a local park to bide his time until his family left the house. Once Andrew was sure they had gone for the day, he returned home. Andrew's return to the house had been captured on his neighbor's closed-circuit security system. He changed out of his uniform and put it in the washing machine. He hung his blazer up on the back of a chair and got dressed in normal clothing, taking his PSP and his wallet, putting them in a patched satchel. Andrew began the walk to the Doncaster train station and stopped at an ATM along the way. He withdrew the money in his account, about 200 pounds, but he had not brought the birthday money that still sat at home. When Andrew arrived at the train station, he purchased a one-way ticket to London. Andrew arrived in London around 11.20 in the morning. Many speculate that he had been going to see 30 Seconds to Mars that evening. However, Andrew leaving King's Cross Station is the last sighting of him on the CCTV. How does someone just disappear? Why would a young teenager who seemed content in his life just pack up and leave? Things had been changing in Andrew's life before his disappearance. About 18 months prior, he had stopped attending church with his religious parents. They assumed at the time that he was just following in his older sister's footsteps. For years, he had also been a Cub Scout but left, stating he was bored a few months before his trip to London. Andrew quite literally vanished. It was discovered that the police hadn't asked to review the tapes from King's Cross Station until a month later, and that they never requested footage from Andrew's local train station. Theories on where Andrew was began to circulate. In 2008, it was thought that he could have been in Shrewsbury. A man turned up to the Leominster police station claiming he had information about Andrew. But when an officer arrived to question him, the man was gone. Then, in 2011, a company offered to comb the Thames after speculation that Andrew was in the river. While the search brought up a body, it was not his. 
Another interesting development came after the BBC did a feature piece on Andrew years later. They received an anonymous letter from a person who claimed they had been the person at the police station, but there was no proof to back this up. More recent sightings of Andrew suggest a person fitting his description may live in Lincoln after an internet chat with a stranger. The family got a tip around the 10th anniversary of Andrew's disappearance that someone had been talking online to an Andy Roo. Andy Roo said they needed money to pay rent. Through conversation, this person finds out that Andy Roo doesn't have a bank account because they left home at the age of 14. The reason? Because they felt like leaving. The police looked into the conversation, but the website had recently changed systems and most of the user data was lost, turning up another dead end. Andrew's family continues to hold hope, often driving around Lincoln and looking for anyone that might fit his description. Next, we move on to the story of Trevor Dealey, a 22-year-old IT tech with Bank of Ireland Asset Management. He was the youngest of four and a hard worker. He didn't complain while doing his job and he stayed far removed from work gossip. So how does a man who walks back to his office for an umbrella vanish from the face of the earth? What would lead a man content with his life to disappear? Much like Andrew, the last time he had ever been seen was on CCTV footage. However, something much darker seems to be lurking at the edge of Trevor's story. December 7th, 2000, the Bank of Ireland asset management employees are having their Christmas party. Though the official party is at the Hilton Hotel, many have migrated to Copperface Jack's for drinks. After a few drinks, the party moved to Buck Whaley's nightclub. The night goes on and Trevor stays at the party until close to the club's closing. It is a miserable night, rain coming down as he leaves the club. And then, on the footage, we can see a person in a black hoodie following Trevor. The person in the hoodie seems to be walking at a distance behind Trevor. But soon, they both disappear from sight. Trevor scans his security pass at his office at 3.35 a.m. But before he scans the pass, he is stopped. The cameras had captured a figure in a black hoodie hiding half behind a pillar around 2.59 a.m. The figure waits. When Trevor walks by, the person in the hoodie approached him. The conversation is short. Neither Trevor nor the figure seem to know the other. Trevor doesn't leave the office again until minutes after 4 in the morning, but this time he appears to be alone. At 4.06 a.m., Trevor places a call to his best friend. Whether the call of a man who is drunk and feeling emotional, or a man who knows something bad is about to happen, it is not clear. The message he left on Glenn Cullen's voicemail said, Hi Glenn, I've missed you there. Just on my way home, all going good. I'll talk to you tomorrow. 4.14 a.m., December 8th, 2000, was the last time Trevor Dealey was ever seen. Footage last shows Dealey walking by the Bank of Ireland on Haddington Road, a figure dressed in a black hoodie following him at a half run, half walk. Trevor didn't show up at work the next day, which was unlike him but most chalked it up to the amount of alcohol consumed the night before. When Monday morning rolled again and there was still no Trevor, people began to fear the worst. Trevor's boss, Dara Tracy, grew worried. He asked everyone if they had seen Trevor since the Christmas party, but none had. How does a grown man vanish into thin air? Some speculate that he vanished to start a new life over in Alaska with a woman he had met in Dublin. This was dismissed, though his sister did go to Alaska to look for him. There are others who believe Trevor was murdered. Drowning was considered, but ultimately ruled out. He had been drunk and it was entirely likely that he had fallen into a river. 
However, his phone continued to ring days later. Had Trevor been dead in the river, the phone would have stopped working. In 2017, investigators received news that Trevor had been threatened at gunpoint. It was alleged that he had fallen into a bad crowd with a known criminal who was involved in gang activities, drug dealing, and prostitution. Trevor was said to have been brought to a home and subjected to abuse. Most assume that this abuse means he was roughed up. It is said that Trevor was accidentally shot. It was claimed that the man had only intended to intimidate him, but the gun accidentally misfired and killed Trevor. Trevor's body was said to have been dumped in a drain located on the side of Old Lucan Road, but no remains were ever found. Our final disappearance comes in the form of Brian Schaefer, another man who was last seen on surveillance footage before disappearing. Let me tell you, the man was not having a good year. Mere weeks before his disappearance, Brian Schaefer's mother, Renee, passed away from cancer. Most thought Brian was handling his grief in a healthy way. They never expected the worst would come to pass. On the night of April the 1st, Brian is at dinner with his father, Randy, and his younger brother, Derek, before heading to the bar with a former roommate. Clint Florence and Brian Schaefer headed to a bar called Ugly Tuna Saluna shortly before 9 p.m. The bar was in the Arena District of Columbus, Ohio. The area was known for a higher crime rate, though it was conveniently located close to Brian's apartment. Brian was a medical student, as was his girlfriend, Alexis Wagner. On the night of April the 1st, she was visiting family in Toledo, but phone records show he placed a call to her around 10 p.m. At the end of their call, Brian tells Alexis that he loves her. Those would be the last words Alexis would ever hear from the man she thought she would marry. Brian and Clint eventually decided to bar hop, going to Short North and meeting up with Meredith Reed, a friend of Clint's. After doing several shots, the trio heads back to the Ugly Tuna Saluna. They arrive around 1.15 in the morning, Cameras can see Brian talking to two college-aged girls as they ride the escalator to the bar. In the security footage, he appears to say goodbye to the girls and leaves. Brian Schaefer was never seen again. Brian never made it back to Clint and Meredith. The pair had assumed he went back to his apartment and thought nothing of it as he was grieving the loss of his mother. But they still tried calling his cell several times that night and throughout the weekend. There is no answer. Monday morning comes and Brian's family finds out he had missed a flight that had been planned for a long time. Instead of heading to Miami with Alexis for their spring break, Brian's family was calling the police. Brian's vehicle was found in the parking lot of his apartment building, but he is nowhere to be found. A citywide search was launched. Officers went as far to comb through dumpsters and sewers looking for any trace of Brian. Though the police did not have a motive, they could not rule out foul play as a possibility. The area was known to be high crime. Brian's apartment was even broken into shortly after his disappearance. Though it was later revealed that the break-in had nothing to do with Brian's vanishing. Randy Schaefer was a wreck. First from the loss of his wife, then, the loss of his son. Randy sees a psychic who says that Brian's body is located in water beneath a bridge. Hours are spent by Randy and a search party combing through the Olentangy River. They didn't find any clues. Even though Brian can't be found, his family and girlfriend refuse to give up hope. Alexis continues to call his cell phone every day until one day in September, the phone doesn't go straight to voicemail. Instead, the call rings three times before heading to voicemail. Alexis calls back, but the phone doesn't ring. As it would turn out, the phone had pinged off a tower in Hillard, a short 14 miles from Columbus. However, the ping was more likely a glitch in the system than a sign that Brian was alive and well. All in Brian's life were willing to take a polygraph, all except Clint Florence. 
the very same man who had been with him on the night of his disappearance. Clint's lawyer spoke, saying that Clint had provided all of the information he could and that he also had nothing to hide. Others were not convinced. Brian's brother Derek alleged that Clint spoke negatively about Brian after he disappeared, which aided in raising suspicion, though there was no evidence that would lead into a further inquiry into Clint. In 2008, Randy Schaefer passed away while still not knowing the whereabouts of his son. However, there was still hope. In an online condolence book after Randy's passing, there was a note that read, To Dad, Love Brian, with the location of the U.S. Virgin Islands attached to the message. While this offered some a chance at home, it was revealed to be nothing more than a cruel prank played on a public access computer. There are theories floating around about what happened to Brian, though there is very little evidence to support these theories. One theory is that Brian was talking to the band and left when they did. Something awful happened later. This is hard to believe as there is no security footage of Brian leaving. Others claim he died at the club and the staff hid the body, knowing how to turn off or avoid the cameras in the area. Still, more claim he fell victim to the Smiley Face Killers, a ring of criminals that targeted those they deemed privileged. Though there are many theories floating around, nothing can truly be known. One day, their lives were relatively normal. The next, Andrew Gosden, Trevor Dealey, and Brian Schaefer had disappeared off the face of the earth moments after appearing on CCTV footage. What really happened to these men? We may never know the truth. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. A playlist is going to pop up right now with more videos that you'll love. See you guys next time.